Well, what do you know? We've celebrated another Christmas. The fact that God's promised Messiah really did come. And if you and I will choose to believe him and trust him, we can benefit from a new and living way. The writer to the Hebrews put it this way in chapter 10, starting at verse 19. He says, Therefore, brothers, since we have confidence to enter the most holy place by the blood of Jesus, by a new and living way open for us through the curtain that is his body, and since we have a great priest over the house of God, let us draw near to God with a sincere heart and full assurance of faith, having our hearts sprinkled to cleanse us from a guilty conscience and having our bodies washed with pure water. Let us hold unswervingly to the hope we profess, for he who promised is faithful. Oh, man, what a passage. <clears throat> well, you know, Christmas is a big event, it really is, and is celebrated all over the world. It is absolutely phenomenal, and rightly so. Imagine, though, the joy that you and I can have, the hope. The world is starving for what we have in Jesus Christ. So how do you go about a new start, beginning anew? There really is a futility in uh, New Year's resolutions, no matter how short or long your list may be. Trying a little harder doesn't seem to accomplish it. Doing a little more doesn't seem to get it done. What if there really was a gate that you could walk through and we could find a new way, a new hope, an ensured success at living living well because of the Jesus way. You know, God's word recognizes our problem. It says that man is lost, that he's alienated from God, that he's exiled, separated from God. And this disconnect from God explains the problems, the loss of spiritual life, hopelessness, purposelessness, and a raft of dysfunctions that we are suffering from as a society, not just as individuals. Now, the cure for the individual ills and societal ills that are popular today or that plague us today is simply to reconnect with God as an individual, as a society. And in reconnecting with God, we become restored as well as reconciled. Effort in religion has failed. <clears throat> it doesn't matter how many steps you climb or how many pilgrimages you go on or how many rituals you try to do. It doesn't cut it. Only believing in Jesus Christ and obeying what he says to do will make the difference that we're looking for. It's really not what we have. It's not what we've done that counts, actually. It's who we know and what we are what God can make us into that really matters. So the first thing out of all of this is I want you to see with me that we have a confidence to approach the Holy God, the throne of the Almighty. The writer says, since we have confidence to enter the most holy place. Now the picture is back to the Old Testament a tabernacle where only the priest could go into the Holy of Holies or the temple again where only the priest could go in. But in the New Testament, every one of us is invited to step right in confidently into the presence of a living, holy, awesome God. It's really easy to feel unworthy. Who of us doesn't feel unworthy? We, we don't think of ourselves as being fit in any kind of way for God's presence. And, and we ask ourselves, who am I? Seriously, who am I that God should care about me? Who am I that God would welcome me or desire to have fellowship with me? You know, if, if anyone knew what I've done, we, we think, and all of us know that we're sinners and unworthy so if, if God knew, but, but wait a minute, 
God knows. He knows. He knows that evil lurks in our heart. Sometimes it's true that for us, at times more so than other times perhaps, God seems very far away. Now, we read about how his presence was with the children of Israel in the Exodus, how a pillar of fire by night and a pillar of fire by day, uh, a pillar of cloud by day was the symbol of his presence. But entering the Holy of Holies, coming into the presence of God, no, no, no. That was too awesome a thing. And so only the priests, only the high priest, and only once a year. But the story is that the atoning work of Jesus Christ makes it possible for us to come. So along with the crucifixion narrative and resurrection narrative, we have this picture of how the veil in the temple that veiled people off from the Holy of Holies was torn from top to bottom. And it's as if God says, okay, come on in, all of you come. Come kids, come sit on my lap. And it's easy to come to God now since Jesus made a way. So the second thing we have is a very clear invitation to intimacy, not just to come near, but to step into a, um, intim an intimate relationship with God. The writer to the Hebrews says, let us draw near to God with a sincere heart in full assurance of faith. In the New Testament, then, this welcome is given to anyone who will accept it. Come on in, shepherds. And shepherds were the outcasts of society, but, but outcasts are invited to come, see for themselves, worship freely. Wise men were foreigners, and they were invited to come. And they did. They came and found the Christ, the Messiah, and bowed down and worshiped him. We read in the New Testament that the common folk heard Jesus gladly, it says. They were excited to come and listen to this man who spoke not as the scribes, as the Pharisees, but as one who had authority. The book of Revelation at the end of the New Testament closes with an invitation to come. We read, the spirit and the bride say, come. And let him who hears say, come. Whoever's thirsty, let him come. Whoever wishes, let him Take the free gift of the water of life. Wow, that's an invitation. It's not an invitation just to satisfy our curiosity, but it's an invitation for help and hope and intimate fellowship and even the gift of eternal life. Eternal life isn't just more of the same old, same old. Man, it's the kind of life that God has and wants us to have, he wants to share it with us. The third thing I see in this passage is that there's a means of cleansing. And it is specifically, as the writer says, to the, it is by the blood of Jesus, by a new and living way, open for us through the curtain. Wait, wait a minute. Wasn't the curtain? Or, no, 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 no. This is a different curtain. This is the curtain that is his body. The body of Jesus had to be torn open. And since we have a great priest over the house of God, that's who Jesus was. And he represents us to God. You know, blood, the theme of blood runs through the Bible like a scarlet thread. Right worship always involves shed blood. Remember the story of Cain and Abel? Abel brought shed blood, a sacrifice. But Cain tried to do wrong worship through the products, the produce that he had gleaned and harvested. The tabernacle and later the temple had rituals of worship and always they involved, first of all, shed blood, the shed blood of animals. Now that was just a means of uh, sharing with us what God wanted to fulfill in the shed blood of Jesus. The shed blood of animals are just a kind of an illustration so that we can understand the costliness of sin, but so that we can also understand 
that atonement is through shed blood. And we learn about a substitutionary sacrifice. A righteous person could die for an unrighteous one. But unless it was in, infinite, it would only work for one. So the blood of Jesus had to be holy or sinless, and it had to be infinite in order to work. Now, it wasn't about the temple building or about the body of Jesus alone, uh, but, but it's about the breaking, the tearing wide open into a new and living way open for us. In the temple, the veil was torn wide open from top to bottom so that God is accessible to us. Jesus said, I am the bread of life. And then he said, this is my body broken for you, torn wide open, so we could get at the God that lived inside that body. That which God veiled then from us was torn wide open so that we have accessibility to God himself. In Jesus, you see, justice is satisfied. And if you and I will accept it, he made it possible on our behalf. Acceptance is what's called faith. Receive God's offer and it's ours. The fourth thing we see is a hope to hold. So the writer says in verse 23 of this 10th chapter of Hebrews, let us hold unswervingly to the hope we profess for he who promised is faithful. You and I have hope. Man, let's hang on to it. Don't turn loose of it for any reason. Don't trade it off. Don't throw it away. You see, <laughs> you know, <coughs> excuse me, it only takes one generation to lose the hope we have in Christianity, the blessings we have in Christianity. And there are times when you and I might be tempted to turn loose, sometimes to open our hands to, to take something of lesser value, we will turn loose of what really matters. Sometimes we turn loose when the going gets tough. Sometimes we turn loose in a careless moment of temptation. <clears throat> but what we have in Jesus Christ is hope. Let me tell you, no other religion offers hope. Oh, it offers you some kind of a way that might bring you peace with God, but it never gives hope, and it never gives assurance of peace with God. So, this isn't just a philosophy. It isn't just a religion, and it isn't just a belief system. This is the promise of God, and you and I have it. In Jesus Christ, all we have to do is accept the God who came in flesh in the person of Jesus Christ. What a message. Pray with me. Father, thank you. Thank you for the fact that through the tearing open of Jesus' body, we have access to the God who came veiled in flesh. What a message. Thank you for the hope that we have in the Christ event that we have celebrated this Christmas. Now help us to live well, live in the shadow of all of this promise, all of this glory, all of this blessing that only you can give. And I thank you for it all in Jesus' wonderful name. Amen.